Two weeks ago, I was on the day <laughs> being admitted into the hospital, and they were figuring out what was going on and figured out that uh, my gallbladder had gone bad. And I mean real bad. And so they knew that they were going to have to take it out, uh, but they didn't know exactly when. And so basically for 48 hours, uh, I laid there flat in that, in that hospital bed, and they wouldn't let me not only eat, they wouldn't even let me drink anything, not even a little sip of water, nothing like that. All I had was this, this little stick with a sponge on it that you dip in the water, and then they can go around your lips. Of course, I'd, I'd suck on that thing too, you know. I mean, I didn't know if you were supposed to, but it's there and I'm going for it, you know. And, uh, but that's it. 48 hours. I couldn't have anything. And I, I, was, I was, like, forget, forget a steak or a burger. Like, I just want a cup of water, you know. I mean, just give me something. But I, I, just all you have is that sponge. And I'm going to tell you, I mean... There are worse situations to be in by far, I know. But I was miserable. Miserable. They finally came and, 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 and took me to have the surgery. And it's funny because they, you know, they started I'm in that little pre-op room and they're getting me ready and then they, they, they come in and she's like, all right, I'm going to, you know, give you a little something. And I'm thinking, you know, okay, we're going to wheel back to the operating room and then Y'all make sure I'm out before you start cutting, you know, type thing. And I'll count down, the mask on and all that. But I remember coming out of the pre-op room and turning the corner. That's it, man. I don't, I don't know nothing else. I don't remember anything else. That was good stuff. Next thing I know, I'm waking up in recovery. Kind of coming to, and I look down, and I got a cup of ice in my hand. And uh, I'm like... Can I have that? And they're like, yeah, you can. And I'm going to tell you what, I ripped into that thing like it was candy. You know, it was like, no, 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 no. That's good, that's good. You know, that's good. <laughs> the simplest things, because I was so miserable. Just give me some ice, you know. That was 48 hours. 48 hours. That's nothing. Today in John chapter 5, we're going to see an encounter that Jesus had with a man who had been lame for 38 years. 38 years. I'm going 48 hours. That's nothing. This man had been lame for 38 years. I want you to look at this with me right there at the beginning of chapter 5. We're going through this series, and this, today is kind of kicking it off, but we're talking about who is Jesus this summer. You know, it's not about what other people say or what other people come up with or how people re-envision history or rewrite it. It's about what does the Bible tell us about who Jesus is, because that's the real Jesus. And in the Gospel of John, he is intent on letting you know who the real Jesus is. Jesus is God. And in that, he gives seven signs, seven miracles, because seven's the number of God. He doesn't give every miracle Jesus does, but he gives seven because he wants you to understand exactly who Jesus is. And then he gives seven I am statements. I am goes all the way back to Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt as slaves. And Moses said to God, who shall I say sent me? And God said, I am who I am. That became a title, a name, a proper name of God. And so when Jesus says, I am, he is making a claim statement on being God. And so what we're going to be doing throughout this summer is we're going to be alternating between the signs and the statements. And what I've done is, I haven't taken them in chronological order, but what we've done is we have taken them and we have grouped them together with similarities. So a sign and an I am statement, okay? So today we're starting off with the lame man. If you look with me in your Bibles, in John chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says, And after this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
And now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In this, in these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. While I am going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. And now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who's the man who said that to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said, see, you're well. Now sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. Father, I pray this morning that you would take your word, your scripture, and God, that you would apply it to our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So the Bible says that Jesus, after a feast, was walking into Jerusalem, and he came to the pools of Bethesda. This is kind of in a northern part of Jerusalem, and he says there were five colonnades there. A uh, colonnade is basically a portico. It's kind of like a covering area, so that it kind of protects you from, uh, from the weather. And under there, it says there were many who were there who were uh, infirmed. They were blind, they were invalids, they were paralyzed, and they were all there and, and, and the Bible says that uh, when Jesus talked to the man, uh, Jesus is coming along, and, it, and it, it's clear there's many who are there, but G- Jesus zeroes in on one, okay? And, and he goes to one, and he says something amazing, all right? You got a guy who has been basically lame for 38 years, and Jesus asked him a question, do you want to be healed? Duh. What? I mean, yeah. But the guy doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. He's been lame for so long. This is, this is part of who he is. And he doesn't even say yes. I mean, to him, I guess that's an irrelevant question. But he makes this statement, and he basically says, when, when the water is stirred, I can't get to the water fast enough. Now, basically, that's all that the Scripture tells us. There is a legend there that that the pool of Bethesda, that when the waters started rippling and stirring, whoever got in the water first would be healed. Now, the Bible doesn't actually tell us all that, and we don't really know what went on at the pool. But we do know this. That's what they thought. They thought first one in gets healed. And so when Jesus comes by and he says, do you want to be healed? And this man, he's laying down. He's been laying down for 38 years. And he's like, I can't get to the water. Every time I try to go, I see the water, I can't get there. Somebody's always beating me. So basically what he's telling Jesus is, that's an irrelevant question. Do I want to be healed? You don't get what you want. I've been here 38 years. 38 years, I can't get to the water. And in his mind, that's the only way it worked. It's the only way you get healed. You got to get to the water. He's feet away from it, and he can't get into it. Jesus says, do you want to be healed? I can't get to the water. And Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed, and walk. And we're going to look a little bit more at that statement. But what happens? The man gets up, he takes his bed, 
And he walks out of there. All right? And who does he come across? The first people he comes across are the religious leaders. And dude's like... And the religious leader goes, whoa, stop. What are you doing? I think I'm walking. (laughs) Brother, it's the Sabbath. You picked up your bed. You're a sinner. Because you picked up your bed on the Sabbath. And that's illegal. That's too much work. Can you imagine? You ain't been able to walk for 38 years. And then all of a sudden, you just stood up, you picked up your bed, because a man healed you, and now some religious freak is telling you to put down the bed and stop walking. You ain't walked in 38 years. I say, brother, you can get out of my way right now. I'm walking. And that's basically what he said, because he goes, "Uh, the man who healed me said, get up, take up my bed. You ain't done nothing for me in 38 years. Man who healed me said, get up and walk. And so the guy walked. And they got irritated. Boy, they go, who told you that? And he goes, ooh, I forgot to ask his name. Man, I was so excited about getting up and walking, I forgot to ask his name. And so where does Jesus find him? He finds him at the temple. He kept on walking. He walked right to the temple. That was a good place for him to walk. And Jesus found him, and he says, hey, man, look at you. And I'm sure the guy was like, you know, he did a little river dance. And he goes, you got it? And uh, Jesus says, that's great, man. That's great. Now, don't sin anymore. Turn from your sin so that something worse doesn't happen. And by the way, he wasn't saying so that something worse, like you, you get hit or you'd get lame again, or you'd go blind, or something like that. You know, it's worse than being lame, right? It's eternal condemnation. What he's saying is, turn to him, turn to the one true God, so that you can last for eternity where God is in heaven. That's what's worse. You know, there is something worse than a physical ailment. In fact, the greatest disability that anyone and honestly everyone has is the disability of self. We all have it. You may be healthy, but if you have the disability of self, you are lame. You're without hope, without Jesus. God does not always fit our expectations. He does not always work within our framework. He does not always fit within our box. These religious leaders, they were like, nothing good is going to happen by breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus chose the Sabbath to be the day that he healed this man. And in fact, the passage tells us right here in John chapter 5, it tells us why John included this miracle. He says, and this was why, there at the end, and this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. So in essence, what Jesus is saying is, listen, my father is at work and I am at work and we'll do it any way we want to do it. And we'll do it any time we want to do it. And we'll do it to anybody we want to do it. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. You want to rule people by the Sabbath, but God gave the Sabbath for the benefit of people. And Jesus is basically saying, and I am Lord of the Sabbath. The whole purpose of this thing was to show that God is at work on his timetable, not ours. And he'll do it his way, not ours. But when he does, when he shows up, it's an incredible thing. And what needs to be our response? Because see, God is still showing up. And he's showing up in our lives. And he's delivering us from unbelievable things. He's delivering us from addiction. He's delivering us uh, from sin. He's delivering us from self. He's delivering us from a meaningless life. 
When God shows up, when he delivers, when he pulls us out, when he calls to us, what are we going to do about it? See, really, there's a beautiful picture here of the blending together of the sovereignty and power of God and the responsibility of man to act. Because what could have happened is God could have healed the man and he could have stayed right there. So what should our response be? I think when we look at what Jesus says in this passage, we get four responses that we all need to put into practice. All right? Here's the first one. Jesus says, get up. That's what he told the man. Do you want to be healed? Well, I can't get to the water. Get up. Get up. In other words, let Jesus tell you who you are. Listen to this. Let Jesus tell you who you are. You see, 38 years, the man had been laying here, and for him, this was his identity. Who are you? I'm the lame man. What do you do? I sit here all day long, every day, 24-7. Can't get to the water. What's your name? The lame man. Let me ask you something. Have you ever let your situations define you? Who are you? Well, I'm the addict. Who are you? Well, I'm the liar. Who are you? Well, I'm the adulterer. Who are you? Well, I'm the down and out. Who are you? Well, I'm the poor man. Who are you? Well, I'm the guy that lost his job. Who are you? I'm the guy with a car broken down out here. Who are you? I'm the guy with no money in his bank account. The truth is, we often let our circumstances define us. But you know what? When Jesus says to a man who's been, who has not walked in 38 years, when he says, get up, he's saying, you let me define you. The whole world says, that man can't walk. And Jesus says to the man who can't walk, get up, get up. Let him define you. I love the story of Gideon in Joshua chapter 6. An angel comes to Gideon. Gideon, Gideon's your, he's, he's even less than your average man, all right? Gideon considers himself to be in the, in the tribe of Israel that is the weakest, and he considers himself to be the weakest in that tribe. And in Judges chapter 6, it says an angel of the Lord came And sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, not Oprah, Ophrah, which belonged to Joash while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, please, sir, the Lord is with us. Why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers uh, uh, recounted to us? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us in the hand. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And, he, and Gideon said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midians, just Midianites as one man. In other words, the angel of the Lord came to Gideon. Gideon says, I am the weakest in the weakest clan. In other words, you look out all all of Israel, you ain't going to find a more sorry soul than me. And to that sorry soul, God said, almighty man of valor. You know why? Because when the Lord empowers you, nothing can come against that. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus we got to let God start defining us and calling us and valuing us and listen to how he defines us, not how the world defines us, not how we define ourselves. It's not our circumstance. It's not your looks. It's not your abilities. It's not your popularity. It's not your influence. It's not your swag. It's not your social media followers. It's what God says to the lame man who had never walked, God said, get up. 
And some of you need to be looking at yourself in a different way. I'm not talking about self-esteem here. I'm really not. I'm talking about Christ's esteem. I'm talking about seeing yourself through his eyes, who sees you as a sinner, who sees you as flawed, who sees all your weaknesses, and yet still sees what you are and can be in him. He is our identity. Don't let other people define you, and don't even define yourself. Let God say who you are. Get up. The second thing he says is, take up your bed. Get up. Take up your bed. Pick it up. Why? Because you ain't staying here anymore. You don't need this to have here to lay on all the time. Now your bed actually can become a bed. Someplace you crash after your day of work. Because you're getting ready to get busy. Take up your bed means really let go of the former life. Take up your bed. Sometimes, sometimes we pray for deliverance. God, help me. If you just help me out of this, God, if you help me out of this, I won't do this anymore. I just, God, get me out of this mess. Give me. And we're praying for that. But all the while, we're not letting go of anything. It's kind of like, I'm going to hold on. And God, I need you to pry this out of my white knuckles. All right? And God says, I'll take it. But you're going to have to release it. Take up your bed. You don't need that bed anymore. Sometimes we actually hold on to our sin as a security blanket. We don't like to admit that. But we do. We've grown so used to falling. We've grown so used to relying, to, to leaning on, to letting our sin be our identity that we don't know how to let go. He says, pick up that bed. That bed's been in the same spot. You don't need that anymore. Pick it up. Let it go. We've got to release it. Watch this video real quick. First, he laboriously drills a hole in a giant ant heap when he is sure a baboon is watching him because he knows baboons are incurably inquisitive. Next, he puts some wild melon seeds into the hole and works them in so that they drop into a hollow. Then he saunters off knowing the baboon is burning with curiosity. The baboon doesn't trust that human being at all, so he plays it cool. But he's dying to know what gives in that confounded hole. Finally, Mr. Inquisitive can't take it any longer. He's got to know what's in there. He reaches in, grabs a fistful, and now his hand's too big to come out. If he had the sense to drop the seed, he could free his hand. Now he lets go when it's too late. Now don't be calling PETA and all them, getting them, you know, animal rights on me. Ain't that? that wasn't me. I just showed you the video. All right. But all that monkey had to do was let go. And he could have he run away. But he couldn't let go. We act like that monkey a lot of times. We know we're holding on to something that could destroy us or get us killed. And it's so hard to let go. But when Jesus says, take up your bed, he's saying, this life is over. Let it go. Let it go. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Recently, we had 50 runners from our Run for God group that, that did, the, uh, did the 5K, Jiggy with the Piggy. 50 of them. And I, I was standing there at the finish line 
Not because I finished first, just because that's where I showed up. (laughs) But cheering them on. But I didn't see one of them coming across that line, carrying a bunch of weight and a big old backpack full of heavy stuff. Now, when you're going to run that race, you're going to lay aside the things that would hold you back. Well, that's what sin does. We've got to let it go. Take up your bed. Let it go. Let go of the previous life. And then the third step is walk away. That's what Jesus says. Get up, take your bed, and walk. So here, get up, take up your bed, and then what? You're going to walk away from the previous life. To walk away from it, i got to let go of it. But once I let go of it, I'm not hanging around. You know, sometimes people, they experience kind of temporary freedom from the things that hold us back. And then they think they can test themselves. And they think, well, I think I'll be all right, you know. I, I think I'll be all right just, just, just doing this or doing that. And, and they begin to walk close back to the line, back, back to that line of sin. And they realize how easy it is to fall, you know. came up with this line I said direction is more important than perfection direction is more important than perfection and what I mean by that is when we when we put our faith in Christ when we get rid of the old life when, when we he has redeemed us he has delivered us and now we are walking away from that old life some people get in their minds well now I got to be perfect I can't be perfect that's not what it's about it's about the direction that you're taking how do you feel about your sin now If you're embracing your sin, if you're loving your sin, there's a problem. When the Holy Spirit comes in, he convicts us of sin and righteousness. And we start walking away from the old life. The new has come. It's kind of like these signs right here. The road signs. Right there. There. Which way are you going? It's literally like that. Which way are you going? You going toward new life or are you going back to the old life? When, when Christ saves us, he pulls us out of that. And he'd tell the man, hey, get up, take your bed, and you need to keep hanging out at the pool because now you'll be able to get in quicker. Now you can push somebody else out of the way and you can be first in the pool. No, he said, start walking because you don't belong around here anymore. This is no longer your home. When God calls you, when he saves you, he brings you out of an old life and delivers you. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 through 24, the Bible says, but this is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus To put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Get up, take up your bed, walk, walk away from the old life. And then what do you do? I remember uh, I was a youth pastor at a small church when I was working on my master's degree. We had a guy in there who, I mean, dude, he radically, radically saved. Um, had been in a, a, a deep, deep, deep life of drugs and had gotten saved. He gave his life. And he came into that little old church and, uh, you know, I mean, he was tearing it up. Hey, man, hey, man, all right. And, and all, you know, a bunch of. Made a bunch of people uncomfortable. I thought it was awesome, man. I mean, he just, he was excited. But then he had such a heart and a passion that he, he really, he wanted, he wanted his old friends to come to the Lord. It was tremendous intent, desire. He saw their, their lifestyles of destruction and he wanted them to experience what he had. And so he decided he was going to start going back 
and ministering to them and trying to share the gospel, and he did. But in the process, he got hooked again. No intent, his intent was to help. But there were areas where he was weak where he did not need to be. You got you, you to be smart. And, and in doing so, he ended up walking back towards that previous life. And he ended up taking his own life. First funeral I ever had to do. Horrible. You got to be careful. When you walk away, you got to walk away. And I know people need help. They do. But the same Jesus that delivered you will deliver them, can deliver them, will be the gospel to them. But man, when you walk away, you got to walk away. And that's not just addiction, folks. That's, that's self as well, because self is the great sin. You understand? Like, honestly, listen, you could take every sin that is accounted for, and it all links back to self. It's all about me. So self is the true enemy of our relationship with the Lord. But not only do we walk away, we're actually walking towards something. It's not just walk away. It's not do better, be better, get better. It's what we walk towards. And what do we walk towards? We walk towards a new life in Christ. We're walking away from our old, walking toward a new. Notice what happens when Jesus meets the guy at the temple and he says, hey, you're doing great. Now go and sin no more. In other words, get your spiritual life right. Because a healthy physical body, a lame man who gets up and can walk without spiritual transformation is going to walk right into hell. You understand that? A lame man who gets up and walks without a spiritual transformation is going to walk right into hell. See, you do understand the nature of miracles, right? I want to make sure that you do, so I'm going to tell you right now. Miracles are not for you. They're not for me. They're not for the lame man. They're not for the blind man. They're not for the dead man. Miracles are for the glory of God, period. It's a secondary benefit what human beings receive out of it, but it makes no sense. You're going to heal somebody who's lame, and that means you, that now for the rest of their life, which is still going, that physical life's still going to die, now they can walk around. Great. means nothing. They're not going to spend eternity in heaven. You see, God is not about our momentary comfort, and that's why many times people are thinking, where's my miracle? And I, sometimes you rejoice when somebody gets a miracle, and they, you know, they're, they're, they're diagnosed with cancer, and then they go back to the doctor, and it's gone, and we praise the Lord, and that is incredible. I mean, that's a work work of God, but then other people have cancer and it leads all the way to death and they're like, where's my miracle? It's not your miracle. It's not your miracle. It's not my miracle. It doesn't belong to anybody. It's for the glory of God. And he chooses to heal when he chooses to heal, who he chooses to heal, why he chooses to heal, but it's all about his glory. It's not about us. Don't be looking for your miracle. You look for your God. You look for your Savior who has brought you out of death into marvelous life and has guaranteed you eternity in heaven. He doesn't owe you a thing. And if God does choose to heal you here on this earth, praise the Lord. It's not just so you can be comfortable for a little while longer. Your comfort is in heaven. If he chooses to heal you for a little while longer, it's so you can bless other people, so you can do more, so that you can be his vessel in the lives of other people. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus, walking away from the old life and walking to the new life in Christ. In Romans chapter 7, the Bible says, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. For in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Listen. We all, spiritually, were like the lame man. 
Show that picture. That's us. You know, sometimes, and, and, I, and I go all around the country and all around nations, and I see folks like this, and it breaks your heart, right? But this is us. Spiritually, without Christ, we are all lame. We are all without hope. God does not fit in our little box. He does not do things the way we want him to, when we want him to, how we want him to, to who we want him to. He is God. He is above all. But if we surrender to him, if we listen to him, he's saying, get up. Take up your bed. Release the old life. Walk away from it and walk towards me. And when we do, we become this. We're going to kick that crutch away. Because spiritually we have gone from death to life. This is Jesus. He's the great deliverer who works however he wants, anytime he wants, to whoever he wants. And this is us, defined by him. We surrender to him, empowered by him. To walk away from that which we could never deliver ourselves from into a marvelous new life. All for his glory. What's he calling you to walk away from? What's he calling you to get up from? What's he calling you to let go of? Today's the day to surrender to that type of Jesus. For he is the Lord. I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads with me this morning. How is God speaking to your heart? Everybody's got an individual situation, or their own thing they're going through. But you know what you need deliverance from. But are you willing to submit this morning to his word? Are you willing to do what he says and surrender?